I first uh, came across Nicholas Lemon when we were both reporters at the Washington Post uh, 25 years ago. He, uh, excuse me, Nick, but he struck me as the classic Washington Post stereotype. He was a wiry little guy with uh, egghead looking glasses and preppy attire and the former editor of the Harvard Crimson. He could have made this Midwestern public university kid distrust him more only by wearing a bow tie. I pegged him for one of those guys who would cover the State Department by day, dine at Catherine Graham's Georgetown house by night, and then move on to cover world economics in Brussels or someplace with equally fine restaurants. A kind of budding Joseph Alsop for our times. I could not have been more wrong. Nick Lemon has always, drawn, has always been drawn to the great issues of American social justice or injustice to our nation's unequal distribution of opportunity and privilege, to the injustice, the raging injustice of race. A child of moderate privilege himself, Nick comes from a family of New Orleans lawyers. He has made America's unequal system of distributing privilege one of his great life's inquiries. Even as a preppy reporter for the Post, Nick was out in what was then called the American Ghetto, interviewing people about how the nation's welfare system was shaping their lives. He has said many times since that his great discovery then was that far more important than welfare to how poor urban African Americans lived was where they had come from. Their roots deep in the rural, racist, sharecropping system of the South. As a very young man, just out of school really, Nick swore to himself that he would someday return to that subject. He went on to be a writer and then executive editor of the Texas Monthly, arguably the best city or regional magazine in America. Deciding that he would be a reporter and writer, not an editor, he moved on to become the Washington correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly, where his thoughtful, deeply reported articles on how power and influence and personality shaped policy in the corridors of Washington. Those stories became must-reads for people interested in the dynamic politics of power in our nation's capital. During his years at the Atlantic Monthly, he kept returning to his self-promise that he would understand how the lives of America's urban blacks in the late 20th century had been shaped and presaged by the hundreds of years their ancestors had lived in the benighted South. Nick's very own home region. His 1991 book, The Promised Land, The Great Black Migration and How It Changed America was his delivery on that youthful promise. It tells the story of post-World War II migration of some five million African Americans out of the South following the invention of the cotton picking machine. True to his journalistic roots, Nick does not tell this tale in the jargon and statistics an expert opinion. He finds an abandoned cotton picking machine in a country field near Clarksdale, Mississippi, and there begins his tactile human story told through the lives of real generations of real people, many of them who began in Clarksdale and ended up on the south side of Chicago. Again, in the tradition of the street smart reporter, not the dinner party journalist I had once mistaken him for, Nick interviewed more than 100 people looking for just the perfect example to capture and humanize the sweep of his story. That person turned out to be Chicago's Ruby Lee Hopkins, born in the Mississippi Delta in 1916. Nick went on to become the Washington correspondent for the New Yorker, where long before others in the press or academia were thinking about the subject, Nick began to chronicle the thinking and the power of the conservative intellectuals who are looking to remake the Middle East into a more pro-Western and pro-democratic region through force of arms. Even before 9-11, Nick Lemon was writing articles that predicted that the Bush administration could very well go to war in Iraq. After the war began, when my scholarly colleagues kept complaining to me that the press that monolithic entity that supposedly moves through America with a single mind, had not told the public about the administration's plans for war, I would cite Nick Lemon and The New Yorker as my defense. <laughs>
Nick Lemon's pieces were so convincing, in fact, that more than a year before the war in Iraq, I told my wife that we should take all of our savings out of the stock market because President Bush was going to go to war and the stock market was going to crash, at least temporarily. Unfortunately, I did not take my own advice, and tonight I want to tell Nick that I will never doubt him again. Nick's 1999 book, The Big Test, The Secret History of the American Meritocracy, about how the SAT exam came to define and create America's modern post-World War II meritocracy, of which many of us here tonight, with our prize-winning test scores, are beneficiaries, became an important part in the national debate that led to substantively altering the SAT and to an increasing number of colleges and universities deciding to stop using the test as their central admissions criterion. Nicholas Lemon is a gritty journalist. He will go into the field with poor sharecroppers, wander the streets of America's poorest urban areas at night, sit across the desk from the Secretary of State and ask very uncomfortable questions. Yet he is a special kind of journalist because he is also a person of ideas, big ideas. He uses his gritty journalism skills not to titillate or entertain but to unravel the stories of profound public policy through the eyes and lives of people who must live every single day with the consequences of those policies. Nicholas Lemon is here tonight to talk about just journalism and social justice. We could have no better speaker on that topic. His journalism is not journalism as most of you think of it, not the daily journalism of the News Gazette or the New York Times. It is journalism as public scholarship, scholarship done for the masses, done to be read not in the confines of the academy, but in the world beyond. It is fitting that Nick Lemon is here at Illinois to honor the opening of the Leon Dash papers at the University Archives. Because Leon Dash, a journalism faculty member, Pulitzer Prize winner, and Swanland shareholder, has spent his several decade career also doing journalism as public scholarship. Nicholas Lemon today is the Henry R. Luce Professor and Dean of Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. That program was first conceived by the famous 19th century American newspaper publisher, Joseph Pulitzer, more than 100 years ago. Pulitzer, famous for his sensational and his sordid yellow journalism, was simultaneously committed to a journalism that exposed injustice and righted wrongs, which is what he hoped his new school of journalism would help accomplish. Pulitzer once wrote, always tell the truth, always take the human and moral side, always fight for progress and reform, never tolerate injustice, always oppose privileged classes, never lack sympathy with the poor, always remain devoted to the public welfare, never be afraid to attack wrong. Nicholas Lemon is the modern embodiment of that thread in American journalism. It is an honor to have him with us tonight. I give you Nicholas Lemon. Well, uh, let's just go home now. <laughs> it's pretty hard to live up to, but very generous, Walt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will speak for X amount of time, and then I hope to uh, interact with you. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm especially happy to be here because of this occasion. Um, I thought what I would do is, uh, you know, I, I have never been here, and um, I've never seen Leon in situ at the University of Illinois, and just in this day, it's been uh, striking and, and moving uh, to see what an integral and beloved member of this community he is. Um, what I'd like to do is my sort of mission tonight, um, as, as a more specific way of stating the topic of my talk, since Leon is an academic now, to some extent, and since his papers are going into the archives, I think it's appropriate to 
uh, as we say in universities, contextualize him. That is, um, I'd like to sort of give a broad sweep of the kind of journalism that Leon has practiced so well um, and, and sort of say where he fits into the tradition uh, that he has, has uh, made himself such a distinguished part of. Um, this would be, I hope, the kind of material that future scholars m who had been working in his papers uh, might say in their books um, that, that uh, either are about him or use him as an example of larger reality. I also want to say, I'll, I'll return to this at the end, um, there's a note in, in, in the way this talk is, is described of my being uh, very skeptical or possibly skeptical about uh, the future of this kind of journalism, and I'm really not. Um, I'm really optimistic about it, but I'll return to that uh, with, with some uh, caveats and explanations. Um, journalism is a new field, really. At, at Columbia, um, you know, this year we've just uh, started a big year-long course which was supposed to be taught by Illinois' own Jim Carrey, but he fell ill right before school year, but he sort of invented it, called A History of Journalism for Journalists. And uh, in working with Jim over the last two years to design the course, I've learned, you know, just how new journalism really is. Um, particularly re repertorial journalism. Um, in the early days of the United States, uh, journalism was vitally important, but you know, and, and, and you, there you're going to see exceptions. I'm always generalizing a bit here and trying to sort of pull together the main thread. Uh, journalism mainly consisted of, or ambitious journalism, of what I would call sort of printed and disseminated political speech. Work like the work of, say, Tom Paine. Um, pamphleteering. Um, this kind of work has um, become ever more honored and important in the minds of historians because, you know, it's part of the public sphere or civil society or whatever you want to call it. And, and one of the lessons that Jim Carrey has drilled into me is you can't have journalism unless you have a public ready to receive it, and you can't have a public that's ready to receive it unless you have people sort of gathering in places waiting to be given information, argued to, and so on. So early journalism in the United States tended to consist of, again, being very broad, either uh, sort of facts, um, broadsheets that told you what ships have landed in your port, what the prices of things were, and so on, or kind of pamphlet form, or sometimes in the newspapers themselves, political arguments on the issues of the day. Um, what people in journalism were not doing is what Leon does, which is you know what he, what he calls and is now generally called immersion reporting. And in fact, it's arguable that there were no reporters then, or at least there were no professional salaried employed reporters. Um, the roots of this kind of journalism really lie, I think, in fiction. And, and that's a kind of tricky thing to say. I don't mean by that to say uh, people, God knows, people like Leon are making it up or anything like that. It's just that the, we, the first examples you find of work that looks like precursor to Leon's work tends to be presented as fiction and, and to be associated with kind of the early realistic novel. Um, many people cite uh, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year as a kind of first ever book length work of journalism. Um, and, you know, there, all through the 19th century, I guess the, the pinnacle would be the work of Charles Dickens, but there were a lot of pinnacles. Um, novelists, you know, who often would go out and do extensive research in all strata of society. And, and at least a large number or a large minority of them in the poorest strata of society, 
uh, would come back and offer these kind of realistic, close up, and almost sort of shocking reports of life among poor people. But they were presented as novels, and they were novels. Um, and, and presumably these people spent a lot of time doing research, but presumably they also uh, changed lots of details or took material they had gotten and you know, melded them into made up characters, made up incidents, et cetera. Um, so for instance, if you go into the abolitionist period, um, I should say the journalism and social justice category tends, the history of it tends to have these sort of peaks. And the peaks over time are periods of social reform in the United States, or the history of it in the United States, that is. So if you go into the abolitionist period, uh, what you find little, maybe somebody in the audience can provide an audience uh, an, an example to correct me, is somebody saying, I'm a reporter, so I went down to the South to report on conditions among slaves. I took my notebook, here are their names, I spent time in their cabins, here's how they live, and so on. That's, that's what you, is very hard to find. What's easier to find is either uh, things like Uncle Tom's Cabin, that is a presumably somewhat researched, maybe researched only through the accounts of fugitive slaves, but, but presented as fiction, realistic account of slave life on a plantation in the South. Most Americans, to the extent they had a picture of that, it would come from Uncle Tom's Cabin or other novels. And then the other side of the ledger would be things in the tradition of political pamphleteering. Um, that things like The Liberator, for example, um, uh, William Lloyd Garrison's paper, um, the work both before and, and after the Civil War by Frederick Douglass, who was you know, intermittently a journalist with, uh, along with everything else he, he was. And, and this stuff, if, if you've ever read it, tends to be, I mean, it's, it's wonderful, and nobody's really doing stuff like this today. It's all part of the vanished 19th century oratorical tradition. So you'll find these long, passionate, florid denunciations of slavery, or from the southern side, equally long, passionate, florid, florid defenses of slavery, um, you know, printed, and, and you can almost imagine as you're reading the speech, somebody in a town square in a pre-electronic media day, gathering a crowd and speaking for hours on end what you're reading in printed form, either in a, you know, often a partisan newspaper or in a pamphlet or something like that. Um, I've been uh, working on a book uh, about the Reconstruction period, um, and the, you know, obviously a little hard to do firsthand interviewing about that. Um, so I've, I've been, among other things, reading a lot of journalism, and you know, it's kind of consistent with this picture. Um, there's a lot of fiction, um, most of it for this period, for what reason I don't know, on the southern side, you know, uh, the work of the horrifying Thomas Dixon, which led to the movie Birth of a Nation, uh, or um, the work of, of uh, kind of speechifiers, uh, people who are either defending or condemning uh, Reconstruction in these kind of long uh, uh, declamations. Um, there's a couple of early examples of you know, on the ground reporters traveling in the South. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted traveled through the South. Um, a man named uh, Charles Nordhoff traveled through the South. Um, there's there's uh, one particularly uh, black journalist at the time who did some reporting, although more speechifying, but great stuff, uh, named Thomas Morris Chester. Um, but, you know, it's pretty thin layer set against an enormous amount of, you know, persuasive political speech, I suppose you would call it, in a press that is overwhelmingly connected with the very, very, very vigorous uh, 
political party system of the time. Remember, this is the era when you have the first, the only time that a sort of sitting working journalist was a major party candidate for president, namely Horace Greeley, and there was a just impermeable seal uh, between journalism and politics such as makes Fox News look distanced. Um, will you really start to see the beginnings of uh, work like Leon's is, is during the progressive era? And I would say you see it in a couple of places, um, most notably. One is, um, you know, Walt was mentioning Joseph Pulitzer, who <coughs> I didn't know much, <laughs> excuse me, about before I became dean of the Columbia Journalism School, and I've just consistently fallen deeper and deeper in love with uh, since being there. He's a very attractive figure, a, a, a immigrant who became a uh, rich media mogul, but very public spirited and philanthropic, a populist through and through, um, a man with limited formal education who worshipped uh, learning. Um, there's, a, there's a great new book out that I would very highly recommend. I don't know if any of you know a novelist named uh, Nicholson Baker. Yes? No? Um, he's gotten on this cause of saving the original editions of old newspapers. And he and his wife started a foundation to do this. And he just kind of goes around and finds this stuff and finds homes for it. In England, he found a full run of Joseph Pulitzer's sort of climactic newspaper, The New York World, which um, flourished in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It was the paper for, you know, it, it, it competed with Hearst's New York American, also now vanished. They were the yellow journalism, you know, that, that promoted uh, the Spanish-American War and so on. And, and they really were reaching you know, the immigrant population and blue collar population in the big cities. And that was a kind of new phenomenon in American life. Anyway, Baker has put together and, and published a, a wonderful sort of coffee table book called The World on Sunday um, that's just reproductions of pages from the New York World Sunday edition, which he got in this warehouse in England and is now deposited safely at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, the, what the book shows you, just as a minor digression, is the incredible, unimaginably greater than today graphic sophistication of a daily newspaper 100 years ago. I mean, it, it will just blow you away how much better the New York World on Sunday looked than any newspaper looks today, and how imaginative it, it is. Um, but those papers, tended to publish a lot of what I would call kind of sketch journalism. Their, their great subject, you know, was urban life. They loved stories which have a power to, you know, draw people in. Uh, they often published fiction, or they published things that were kind of blend between fiction and nonfiction, where a reporter would go out and write a piece, you know, uh, often about sort of life in the slums, um, presented somewhat for crusading purposes, somewhat for titillation purposes, somewhat for purposes of the reporter coming across as a very brave person. But there'd be um, these kind of 1,200 word, 1,500 word, 2,000 word pieces about, you know, shocking conditions in the slums. Um, and, and they're, you know, recognizable as a kind of starting place to the kind of work Leon does, because the reporter does go on site and obviously has a notebook and, you know, carefully observes and writes down uh, uh, what he or she sees. And this kind of work is of a piece with a sort of adventure reporting, you know, Mr. Livingston, I presume, was, you know, you, you know what I'm referring to, comes out of that kind of adventurous explorer type journalism, war correspondence, uh, exotic travel work done by people like Nellie Bly and Richard Harding Davis. So, so one kind of subgenre there is the, the person who roams the city, particularly the kind of unsavory and unsafe 
uh, and somewhat exotic parts of the city and gives these reports to readers about you know what really goes on. Um, another strain in, in progressive era journalism that's worth noting under the heading of journalism and, and social justice is work that's somewhat more literarily ambitious and also um, has a more explicitly reformist agenda. Um, I would say number one on this list would be uh, Jacob Rees's book, How the Other Half Lives, which was published in 1890. Uh, Rees is a complicated figure. He was um, truly a talented journalist, I think, a talented reporter. Um, this book is set, you know, in Lower East Side slums of New York, places where the, the decent and respectable middle class usually, obviously from the book, feared to go for their safety, uh, and, and where, you know, unspeakable uh, uh, things went on, uh, everyone was certain. Um, and he fearlessly went down there and obviously had some kind of notebook, he had a camera and other ways of recording kind of slum life in New York in the late 19th century heyday of immigration. Um, and he kind of offered uh, this, this big passionate report on it, How the Other Half Lives. He was a close friend of Theodore Roosevelt, very influential uh, journalist. Um, he was, and it should be said, like just about everybody at the time uh, who was, you know, part of middle class discourse, horribly racist without thinking of himself that way. So it's very easy to embarrass him by reading his passages on things like the Chinaman and the Jew and things like that. He just, he, he, it, it just doesn't do him justice to say he trafficked in stereotypes. He practically invented the stereotypes. So he goes back and forth between, you know, exposing these shocking conditions, being incredibly disapproving of the people he's writing about, and sort of blaming some kind of racial or ethnic essence of theirs for the way they live and, and just kind of despairing that they could ever blend in and be people he would not find strange. So, you know, it's a peculiar book, but well worth reading and, and written with great passion. Um, another thing that I perhaps unfairly hold against him is, um, and you know, all of us who have ever done this kind of work face this problem of you sort of go through and do all your reporting and you describe, you describe, you describe, and you get to the end, and I'm sure this has happened to you, Leon, some of you will say, well, what should we do about it? Um, and then you have to confront, well, do I write a little thing at the end saying what we should do about it? And Reese did, because he was really primarily interested in reform um, rather than journalism. And what he suggested was the answer was, quote unquote, model tenements. Um, which is essentially public housing. Um, so in other words, his work was an early place where you find the now supremely discredited view that if government would tear down, you know, low-rise neighborhoods where poor people were living and instead construct these kind of square buildings uh, that had thick walls and things like that, then the whole problem would go away. Um, so I, I think, you know, it came from the right place, but he called that one um, wrong. Another thing I just uh, mention as, as something to go back and read, and it really reads well today, is a little and little known uh, kind of novella length book by Jack London called The Abyss. Um, and that's about uh, the slums of the East End of London in, in the late 19th century. Um, he is mostly not, he, he obviously, as if you know about him, had a whole political history as, as a kind of socialist politician and activist, um, but he uh, was writing more as a kind of literary person. Again, it's a shocking, vivid, direct portrait of life among the poor. Tends to, <laughs> tends to be done from the perspective of a clearly middle class person 
writing in the first person and being like Reese, perpetually shocked by the conditions he finds in, in, in the East End of London. Nonetheless, it represents you know, a real leap forward um, in the sense that he is, in fact, functioning as a reporting, as a reporter. He's going there. He's obviously taking notes. He's either living in or almost living in this neighborhood and, and, and really uh, bringing it vividly to life in, in, a, in a form that's explicitly presented as nonfiction. Um, then you get, if you take my point that, that you know, journalism and social justice sort of peaks in reformist periods, <coughs> I think we can skip from the progressive era to the Great Depression. And there you see, again, a great flowering of this kind of work, um, what, what uh, Daniel Aaron calls uh, reportage. Um, this is work, by this time, movies have come along. A lot of the journalism you read uh, that's done during this period is clearly, uh, in, in, in some cases, kind of nakedly influenced by uh, movies and, 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 and photography and newsreels. Um, it, it, it's kind of stripped down, tough prose, and, and again, you have lots and lots of journalists um, going out in poor areas and, you know, bringing back a picture of, of, of what's really happening there. Um, I, I really think that the, um, well, first from a kind of unexpected source, something I'd recommend highly from this period is um, a little book by Edmund Wilson called American Earthquake, which is, um, I, I say unlikely because you think of him as the ultimate kind of Mandarin literary critic sitting in his house in upstate New York, you know, reading Vico and things like that. But in the de during the Depression, he was uh, working for the New Republic and he actually went out to mostly Appalachia, but all over the country, and as depression journalists often did, wrote about, you know, strikes and things like that. Um, and, and, and it's terrific stuff, just these kind of short weekly magazine reports, uh, reports from the field. Um, there's also, you know, the very famous uh, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, uh, done by James Agee in partnership with Walker Evans. That's a book that I don't love as much as you're supposed to um, because uh, it's so sort of flowery and florid and, and lacks for me, it, it has this, I hate <laughs> this sounds so, so sort of sacrilegious, it feels slightly underreported to me. It, there's, there's a kind of lack of highly specific detail and you wonder how much time he really spent with the families he was writing about or whether he just sort of spent a little time and then went back and did this kind of soulful meditation on, on what he had seen. I, I really think that the, probably the greatest uh, work under this category at the time in a certain way doesn't fit the category uh, because first of all it's uh, done by a government agency and second of all it's photographic and that's the famous farm security file, um, which you've all, if you haven't heard of it, you know about it because you've seen the pictures. Virtually every famous picture of the Depression comes from this effort. Um, this is Rex Tugwell, who was part of FDR's brain trust, professor at Columbia, went to Washington, wanted to sort of propagandize, essentially, for the New Deal. He hired one of his former grad students named Roy Stryker to come down to Washington and uh, start a project, well, start an agency, one of whose activities was to start a project involving photographically documenting conditions among the poor in the United States. A huge, ambitious project that's been the subject of many books and so on. Um, Stryker hired Walker Evans, uh, Gordon Parks, Ben Sean, Dorothea Lang, long list of all the great photographers of the time. He had a very particular journalist's mind, even though he wasn't a journalist, he was an economist, and would send these people out with 
incredibly detailed instructions of what they were supposed to find. Um, and they, you know, came back with these quote unquote stories um, from all over the country, not only beautiful and affecting images, but also people don't know very detailed captions that, that, that uh, Stryker insisted on every subject's name, their occupation, lots and lots of pictures of sort of industrial processes and explanations of how they worked. Um, and, and, you know, these pictures, um, they don't feel like propaganda at all. And they really, you know, are in our consciousness even now. And it, it's, it's, you know, in the aggregate a great achievement and really raise the country's consciousness about poverty. Um, I'll now skip to uh, the 1960s and, and sort of take us from there to the present in this field, again on the premise that I'm sort of hitting these reformist high spots that, that tend to be associated with um, journalism and social justice. Um, the book that is famous for uh, waking up the country to poverty is Michael Harrington's book, The Other America. Um, Herring, I don't know if anybody here has ever read that book. It's a book kind of more referred to and read than read, I would say. And um, it, it really became famous because of a long essay uh, Dwight MacDonald wrote about it in The New Yorker, more than for the book in itself. Um, it is in, I would say, the Jacob Reese tradition. In other words, Harrington, you know, lifelong socialist and activist, is really writing as a political person who wants to call attention to a problem and in service of that goes wandering around the country in poor neighborhoods. Um, the reporting itself is nowhere near the realm of Leon and not even as good as Jacob Rees, I don't think. And, you know, what you don't get is individual people's stories. You, you get a sense he sort of pays visits to poor areas, you know, best with the best will in the world and kind of gives you these general descriptions. But it's definitely not immersion journalism and it's not really intended as journalism. Um, but it helped set off many of the uh, storms and movements of the time, and out of them came a, a really large proliferation of just, you know, not so much books as a lot, lot, lot of newspaper and magazine and television reporting on conditions among poor people in the United States associated you know, very much with the civil rights movement and to some extent with the war on poverty. Um, you also saw at the time um, a lot of publication of memoirs by people who had grown up poor in, in various places, such as Claude Brown's book, uh, Man Child in the Promised Land. Uh, you saw reformist tracts, you saw journalism, and, and so on. But there's one thing that isn't journalism at all that came out in this period that I have to mention because it casts a very long shadow and sort of takes us to Leon Dash and this will be very familiar to you Leon this is the Moynihan report which was published in uh, 1965 um, this, Daniel Patrick Moynihan then an assistant secretary of labor as you know later veteran U.S. Senator from New York, recently died. Um, he had read a, a book that is itself not a work of reporting and was enormously controversial um, called Slavery by Stanley Elkins, and he had been uh, very influenced by that. That was published in 1963. Elkins was a historian who, in turn, had been in, very influenced by the work of another uh, scholar named Frank Tannenbaum who studied uh, race relations in Brazil primarily. And Elkins made a series of moves that, and this sort of thing gets woven into our story very quickly, um, 
a series of moves that he thought of as absolutely good-hearted and liberal that wound up offending, in particular, a lot of black people. And what he did was, he, he said, he, he drew an elaborate analogy between, he first contrasted Brazilian slavery to American slavery and said American slavery was much harsher. Um, then he started drawing on the work of people who had studied uh, people in Nazi concentration camps. Um, that work has offended a lot of Jewish people and has been heavily discredited, but it was the idea that, that being in a concentration camp kind of reduced you to a state of dependency because it was such a harsh system, and then sort of took that and imported it without any empirical research or actual structural link to American slavery and said, this system essentially kind of broke people's spirits in the same way that the concentration camps also broke people's spirits. I mean, one good thing about this book is it set off, you know, 300 PhD dissertations or something to refute it. Um, but nonetheless, it presented this picture of African Americans as a sort of broken people because slavery had been so harsh. And Moynihan was very much in the sway of this book when he produced the Moynihan Report, which was an internal government report that he leaked. In fact, I believe he leaked it to Bob Novak, if you can believe it. Um, I think that's actually true. Um, but anyway, he, he was looking at, at that time, you know, you were at the tail end of the black migration from the rural south to the cities. And suddenly, he was seeing very, very big rises in black out of wedlock childbearing. And he, you know, was kind of super alarmed about it, was calling attention to it in big, bold headline terms, and was, you know, relating it to lower workforce participation, labor force participation. So here you had this picture of, again, a kind of broken or defeated uh, uh, African-American population, or uh, he used the word damaged, I think, and pathological, you know, uh, uh, because of the legacy of slavery. And, and the chief kind of example of this uh, was very high out of wedlock birth rates. And by the way, um, he sort of tried out some of this stuff without people noticing very much. Um, in, in an earlier book he did with Nathan Glazer called Beyond the Melting Pot. Um, but this came out at a hinge moment, exactly the wrong moment for Moynihan, and uh, his work was also much, much, much attacked, much, much, much refuted, and it, it just, it coincided with kind of the dawn of the Black Power Movement, and, and it was kind of everything the Black Power Movement was started to oppose. Um, so the effect of that, uh, as Moynihan often reminded people for years, was that out of wedlock, black childbearing, particularly by teenagers, was a kind of taboo subject. And, you know, as we say now, didn't say then, don't go there. Uh, it was not something uh, that, that there was a lot of work done on once the wave of immediate refutations of the Moynihan Report uh, came out. So it tended to be a subject that journalists didn't tackle um, for quite some time. Um, and, 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 you know, you can't imagine a more sensitive topic. One other thing that's worth mentioning as sort of background to Leon is right around that time, you know, there was a whole tradition, there's several traditions in American sociology, including, you know, a theoretical tradition, um, and then the, a wonderful kind of street or ethnographic tradition associated with uh, Robert Park, a former journalist at the University of Chicago. But in the 60s, particularly the late 60s, um, sociologists were starting to be able to do quantitative work. 
uh, on subjects like poverty and class. And the reason they were able to do it was really two things. One is there were these great data sets that had been built over the preceding years, um, uh, particularly uh, the one, if you know, sociology by Otis Dudley Duncan and Peter Blau and, and various others. There was one associated with the Coleman Report uh, done in the Department of Education. Um, and the other was the development of computers that could sort of process all this data and turn it into statistical analysis. So the net of that was that sociology, sort of street sociology, really died for a generation, at least on subjects of urban poverty, which used to be the classic uh, topic for American sociologists. Um, and instead, people did these data runs, and as I sometimes say to the great annoyance of quantitative sociologists, you know, you still have, and it's getting better, but you really had for a long time, and Leon knows this from experience, a generation of America's top experts on poverty, most of whom had never met a poor person, and they were just working from data. Um, and their argument was, it's better to work from data, and you saw this in the Moynihan Report and various other things. We, it, it is very important to eschew sensationalism and these kind of melodramatic theories about people, about poor people that have been associated with non-quantitative work about the subject ever since the days of Jacob Rees. And it's important to be, you know, sober and serious and academic and have, you know, testable hypotheses and have everything completely verifiable, partly so that we can kind of have a conversation about this and lower the temperature. And to the credit of these folks, they did succeed in creating a discourse about poverty that was, you know, biracial, um, didn't involve a lot of shouting and screaming and, you know, with some exceptions along the way, has been civil and productive. And that's an achievement. It's hard to imagine how contentious all these topics were in the early 70s and how hard it was to talk about them. But nonetheless, sociology's move in that direction was yet another part of this kind of missing piece in, in uh, journalism. So then what happened, now, now to work my way to Leon, is the, quant you know, it, after much discrediting of the Moynihan Report, it turned out that the black out of wedlock childbearing percentage, that is the percent of all African American children born, who are born out of wedlock, kept rising. It has since leveled off and started to decline. I think it peaked, you know, circa 1980 or so. And at one point, I think it got above 50%, is that right? 53%. Um, and that was a kind of wake up number for people. And that was coming out of the work of these quantitative sociologists. Um, so then, uh, it, some of us, including Leon, sort of thought, uh, journalists, sort of thought, okay, what do these numbers mean? Um, it's time to create a human, vivid, journalistic picture that's behind these statistics that have so much shocked people and, and kind of woken them up. And so a, a generation of journalists, um, really starting, I'd say, in the 1980s, kind of ventured into the subject of poverty, but in particular, to inner city ghettos, you know, this word emerged out of sociology, underclass, which itself is a very controversial word that many sociologists have now disowned and isn't used as, as, as much now. But, you know, some of us decided to go out and report on the underclass and try to understand what, um, what this phenomenon was and, uh, who was living this way, why it happened, what were all the factors, what was life like in this community, what direction were things going, and so on and so forth. I would say uh, that Leon, without any question, 
was the greatest of the underclass reporters and, and has done the work of all this work um, that has the most staying power. And that's really because he worked the hardest. Um, he, as you all know, went out, and I'm thinking in particular of his two books, When Children Were Children, which is you know, very explicitly an investigation of this problem of teenage out of wedlock childbearing, and then Rosalie, um, and spent endless amounts of time in very poor communities with people, getting their trust, hanging around, watching the way they live, and bringing us back the details. Nobody spent as much time, nobody got in as deep as Leon did. And um, I want to say, this will sound weird, but I think it's true. In many ways, it was harder for a black person to do this than a white person. Um, it may, be, may have been easier to do the reporting physically, you know, to go into these neighborhoods and kind of move around and win people's trust and get them to talk to you. But in the outside world, I think it was harder because, you know, there was much more pressure. There was a feeling since the Moynihan Report that you're just not supposed to talk about this stuff. If you write about this, it's okay, it's true. Nobody's denying that it's true, but it is to put ammunition into the hands of our enemies. And this kind of information is bound to be misused. It fits into these stereotypes, not just recent, hundreds of years old in the white mind about black sexuality. And you just can't, you know, essentially white people can't handle this kind of information because it plays into such a large region of their sun subconscious and no good will come of it. Um, so particularly when the first series of When Children Want Children uh, came out in the Washington Post, Leon, I think, took heat, a lot of heat, and distinctly more heat than a white reporter who wrote the same series would have taken um, on the grounds of, you're not supposed to let down the side, I would say, if I <laughs> summarize that accurately. Um, so it, 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 his courage and persistence should be understood as having two dimensions, really. One is just the work, and many of you who have been his students have heard about it, been put through many versions of it uh, yourselves. It's, it's work. It's a lot of work. It's fun. It's absorbing. It's strange. And you have these sort of peculiar relationships. And one of the wonderful things about Leon's work is he writes about how peculiar the relationships are with the people you're writing about. But, you know, you have to spend a lot, 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 lot of time. You cannot do this kind of work on the fly. You have to win people's trust. You have to go into their homes. You have to spend a great deal of time with them. You have to talk about their lives over and over and over again. You have to challenge them on things. You have to go on their daily rounds with them. And it, it really just takes forever. It is um, kind of not like, you know, the Georgetown dinners with uh, the Secretary of State that I was doing back in the days when I first met Walt. Um, and, you know, lots and lots of reporters just don't want to do this. It's, it's just not, you know, nice, comfortable indoor work. It takes tremendous amounts of persistence and time uh, to do this. And, you know, one of the many things that's hard about it is it's just hard to see this world because people live in a way that just often breaks your heart. Um, and, you know, you come home and it just hurts what, you, what you've seen. It's, it's, um, and it's also tough because, as you see in Leon's work, your sympathies are with your subjects, but you're trying to be, you know, a journalist and tell people how it really is. And it leads to just a constant uh, conflict. It's not like, it, you know, you're saying, I'm just here to confront the people I write about and just make life difficult for them. Um, 
So that, that leads to a lot of problems. And then the other dimension of courage is just writing about this in a truly unvarnished way, uh, which when you get back into the newsroom and your middle class life in the outside world creates trouble for you. Not life-threatening trouble, but distinct trouble. Um, one of the great things about, about these books of, Leon, of Leon's, and, and those of you who have read them uh, know this, they are really unvarnished, uncomfortable truth. And it's not just out of wedlock childbearing, it's drug use, it's crime, it's just people screwing up, you know? Um, he doesn't try, if I can sort of diss somebody who was probably very popular in this crowd, if you read the work of Jonathan Kozal over the years, he is the total opposite of Leon. One, he spends, if you try to really figure it out, very, very little time in C2. Um, you just get the sense of somebody who sort of hops in and spends a couple hours and hops out. And second of all, all poor people in his books are perfect. Um, they, they are virtuous, they are hardworking, they are nobly suffering victims. When quoted, they offer these kind of perfect Marxist critiques of society. And, you know, Leon's the opposite. Um, his, his subjects are real, they're, they're, and they're messy, and, and he obviously loves them, and he obviously has personally contentious relationships with them. He gets frustrated with them as he watches them screw up sometimes. They get frustrated with him as he, from his middle class position, gives his censorious lectures, and you just get real life in all of its glorious messiness in his books. He is committed to doing the work and he is committed to total ruthless intellectual honesty. But what is remarkable about him is, again, there's always love on the page. He is not pinning these people to a board for inspection. He's not tut-tutting and cluck-clucking and shocked like Jacob Rees, um, he's giving you people. And uh, in that sense, it's really the work is closer to Dickens than it is to Jacob Rees or some of his journalistic predecessors. Um, I'll, I'll just end by saying a couple of things um, about larger issues and then I'll you know, talk back and forth with you if you're uh, up for it. Um, First, I want to make a pitch for the social benefits of the kind of work that Leon does and um, the social perils of the opposite of the kind of work he does. What I would call the opposite of the kind of work he does is work where you know, you're taking on this subject, you're working as a reporter, you're delving into it, and then as you're writing, you're constantly saying, now, is this detail good for the cause? Is that detail good for the cause? Um, and you're almost kind of censoring yourself. That kind of work, just as writing, tends not to be very good because it's not really honest. Um, you you can, it's, it's verging more into propaganda and you, propaganda has a kind of feel that emanates off the page. You just, it feels less honest and real and persuasive if the writer is not, is pulling punches, you know, sanitizing, not trying to tell you the way it really is and is kind of writing with an intense one kind of sentence by sentence uh, consciousness of the potential consequences of everything he or she writes. That just, is not productive of good writing. But I would go even beyond that and say that this kind of writing, which its opponents often accuse of being anecdotal or being censorious or being uh, holding up the poor for the titillation of the middle class, it's, it's honest and it's true. And 
as that, it represents a trust, a profound trust for the people who are reading it. It's a way of saying, if you trim your sails in various ways, what you're really saying is, I don't trust the people at the other end of the publishing process. I don't believe they can handle what I know right. Um, what Leon is doing is honoring his subjects by presenting them as real people with all the imperfections that implies. And he's also honoring his readers by saying to them, I trust you to handle this information. And um, I think that, you know, things have gotten a lot better since the very, uh, you know, uh, controversial days of the 1980s when some of us were doing this reporting. Um, the discourse has calmed down a lot. All the, actually, the, uh, in, in, you know, with much variation, the overall kind of underclass alarm numbers have mostly trended better, uh, you know, through the last about 10 or 12 years, although way too early to declare victory, but they're clearly not, you know, getting much worse uh, as they were in, this, in the 1970s. Um, with various trends like deindustrialization that were happening, um, and 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 from our perspective as journalists, you know, we heard a lot of, if you write this, if you publish it, sure it's true, but the sky's going to fall in, and the sky didn't fall in. Um, I think that's pretty clear, and I think the net of the work of Leon, of Alex Kotlowitz, of Jason DePaul. Kate Boo, many other great journalists, is to create more sympathy, more understanding uh, for the issues of social justice and poverty, not uh, to uh, kind of fall into the wrong hands and be misused. I think, and maybe I'm being over optimistic, this is all netted out with great thanks to Leon in a place where we're comfortable much more with journalists who do this kind of work. Social scientists are much more comfortable with this kind of work, including done by academics. Um, and, and, you know, the great silence about poverty that followed the Moynihan Report for a good, you know, 15 years has ended uh, with salutary effects, and that's uh, much due to Leon's work. Um, the other thing I'm optimistic about, as I said at the beginning, is the chances for publication of more of this kind of work. But I want to be careful about it. I am not saying that, uh, you know, the typical media outlet is now going to devote tremendous amounts of time, air time or space to immersion reporting that's ruthlessly realistic on, you know, the conditions of the very poor in America. That's not going to happen. Uh, they're regularly, the, the really, you know, top of the heap in journalism folks do work of this kind. Even for them, it's not the bread and butter. But, you know, a New York Times and a Washington Post and an LA Times and, and a Frontline and, you know, the best magazines, they tend to, every so often, do something that really blows you away in this area. But I really think that the real future of this kind of work lies in books. Um, and the reason it lies in books is that book publishing has developed in such a way that the cost associated, first of all, this kind of work wants to be in book form if you're doing the immersion reporting, because it you have to tell the story at length, and you can get all the complexity and subtlety and detail that the work supports almost only in book form. Also, out there in the world, it's become physically cheaper to produce a book, so if you're willing to forego um, big advances that might be associated with celebrity biographies and things like that, and, and essentially find another way to finance it, you can get this kind of work published, and, and it will last in book form, and it will find an audience. I mean, just to give a dramatic example, at Columbia Journalism School, we have a course on book writing uh, 
It's taught by a professor named Sam Friedman. It's been going for seven years. Um, these are MA, MS students in journalism, kids, um, many of whom write about immersion reporting on urban poverty. 33 book contracts out of this course so far. Um, and again, these people aren't getting the big advances, but they're doing books, they're good, they're getting published. That's where I think the home is going to be primarily for this kind of work, but I think it can really flourish and thrive. And I'll say finally that that's why journalism schools are so important, or one reason why. Uh, if you're a journalist who wants to do this kind of work and you want to do it in book form, a faculty, if it's constructed right on the sort of research faculty model where you're supposed to be publishing, is really the best place and possibly even the only place from which you can, you know, year in, year out, do this kind of work. And conveniently, it's also a place to uh, pass on the skills and values and passions associated with this kind of work. And that, of course, is what Leon's been doing here for the last few years. Um, so I think, you know, journalism and social justice is alive and well. Its format home for the next generation is going to be primarily books. Its institutional home is going to be primarily places like this, schools of journalism. Thanks very much. And um, I rambled on for some time, but any questions? Okay, hi. No, I'm, I'm just kind of actually surprised to hear you say that there was a violence on the one hand. And it seems to me that Celia's Wilson wrote the truth is a man, you have John Murray, you have a, it seems to me a whole genre of literature. Let me, let me be specific then, because I can't explain. Uh, first of all, you know, Wilson, Murray, et cetera, that was a good decade after, decade plus, 15 years after the Moynihan Report. Second of all, these, you know, this sort of fits with my other point. Uh, Murray and Wilson don't, are not journalists and they're not ethnographers. Um, they are, each in his own way has some personal experience with this, but they're basically, you know, classic of the time, they're reviewing data sets and writing on the basis of what's in the data. So uh, the silence went on for some time and then went on for longer if you define it as repertorial silence rather than silence of sort of public intellectuals, policy analysts, quantitative sociologists. So that, I think, sort of squares that circle. Well, well, again, you know, what, what I'm really calling for and praising here or trying to is reporting about this by journalists. And, and that's where I think people tended especially to shy away. And again, even in the realm of social science, the people who are doing it from the, their office reading, you know, data runs, it, 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 there was a real gap. So that, I'm really not saying, you know, the specific kind of thing I'm talking about is if you're a social scientist, you would call ethnographic work. And of that, there was relatively little for some time, although there were some, like the work of Eli Anderson, but it was a kind of small part of the chorus. Sir? I guess we're supposed to use the microphone yeah. if it's on. Okay. Uh, I found your references to the other America very interesting because 42 years ago I remember picking that up and reading that and thinking of how important it was to me to get this picture, mm -hmm. not just as a report, not just as scholarly data, but someone who was an activist and an advocate pulling all this stuff together and giving kind of the big picture. Mm -hmm. So it combined a lot of different skills for me as a young professional, but I think I reacted to it not just 
by itself, but think of what else was coming out. You rep, uh, mentioned uh, uh, Manchild and so on. Uh, the Fire Next Time came out just almost the same time mm -hmm. as The Other America. Yeah, that was 65. I think they were both in 63. I, I'll challenge maybe, you. On maybe that. you're right. I think they were both okay. in '63 because yeah, I, I think they, okay. And the reason I do is that I moved to Berkeley, and was reading both books at the same time. Now I, I'm saying that not just to be biographical, but to make the point that you made really early in your remarks. It's a multiplic multiplicity of disciplines or of disciplinary skills that bring this kind of data together. Mm -hmm. It isn't just a narrow definition of reporting or fiction or whatever. It is a kind of scholarly advocacy, if you will. Right, well, first of all, <coughs> just to repeat myself, I, I, you know, The Other America is nowhere in the league of Leon's books in terms of, you know, you can't come away from the book and say, wow, he just took me into the life of this particular person who I will never forget, because he's kind of, passing through these neighborhoods. But he was very vivid. And, and also, my thought that brings to mind is another place to make a plug for journalism schools. You know, one of the play things journalism schools can do is kind of bring together people who can teach you about the reporting stuff that's very hard to learn. You need to be carefully walked through with people who can teach you the contextual stuff that's also hard for working reporters to pick up on their own. And you know, both forms of knowledge exist in a university like this, so you can kind of bring them together in one place. By the way, you know, one thing I forgot to mention when I was talking about Leon's predecessors, um, briefly, but it's interesting, in it, um, Du Bois's book, The Souls of Black Folks, that has several chapters where he's doing a kind of reporting exercise. Um, uh, particularly in the Deep South. And again, he doesn't get to the level of individual characters in their lives, but it's still pretty vivid and interesting and, you know, good reporting, really. Hi. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to ask the question, but it might be a series of observations that will suggest a question. Um, do you have, or can you state any sort of concern you have for uh, this type of journalism to make an impact in the larger culture. I don't, you know, I don't want to say mass culture, but a couple of things. First, while you were talking, I couldn't help thinking of the television media hysteria about Katrina and yeah. the, the, the people who are, um, you know, some of whom are impoverished in New Orleans. And, and just they're sort of, like they couldn't believe it. Like this was a fact that was just sprung on them at the time. Uh, then I was thinking about Professor Harrington's introduction of you, saying that you had predicted a lot of the Iraq things in, in the New Yorker, and I just thought to myself, well, for those of us who read the New Yorker, that's great, but for those of us who don't, um, or the reporters maybe in that larger media who don't, that never, you know, that, I mean, you know, we all read lots of those critiques way before that happened, and it didn't seem to do much good. So could you, so, so I take your point that it's, this is valuable, obviously, but could you say something a little more about how it can impact our society. Well, you know, this is a tender topic for me, you have to say. Uh, and the reason is, and particularly these days now that I'm a dean, because every time, especially I go to a foundation and ask for money to support either a work of journalism or educating journalists, they always say, now what's the impact gonna be? And what, you know, emotionally at least, and I think somewhat intellectually, I'd like to be able to say, look, I can't map the impact one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, we're journalists, we're not in the advertising business, and we're not doing a marketing campaign, and we can't tell you the awareness points we're gonna create out there. And, you know, we, we do our work, we do it the best we can, we try to make it as accessible and, and um, powerful as we can, but in the end, you just gotta kinda put it out there and hope somebody notices. There, you can't make people read it. You can't make the people in the daily news cycle pick it up, and often they don't. But I would say, you know, that we're here having this discussion tonight shows it does have this kind of weird staying power. You know, this stuff is now in the archives, and people will use it for 
a long, long time. Um, it, it, it's just, you know, I, I really believe that in, you know, version of Holmes's idea of the free trade and ideas. And in, in ways you can't predict, if you kind of inject things into public discourse and they're good, they'll hang around and they'll eventually have impact. They can have short-term impact, they can have long-term impact, but it's just very hard to play a winning hand in the game of, okay, how do we get Leon's work on network news broadcasts? I mean, or that's somebody else's job. It's, I, 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 I can't honestly say there's a good way to do that. Um, and, and, and I hope the value of the work doesn't depend on that. First, I'd like to uh, thank you for all of your comments, but particularly for uh, bringing to light the uh, middle chapters of Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks. I th personally think those are the most important chapters, but we're caught up in the literary stuff. Yeah. Two questions, if I can. The first, uh, Leon's work initially appears as a series of newspaper articles, and you talked about the reasons why the Academy is a better site for this type of work in the book format. Could you do the reverse and talk about why newspapers are no longer a good site for this type of immersion journalism focusing on questions of poverty and race? And the second question is uh, the research for your book, um, The Promised Land. In the course of that research, I'm wondering what position, and, and well, let me frame it this way. The knowledge that you gained from that research, I'm wondering how that has led you to think about the important issue of reparations. Um, okay, the second one is going to be harder. Um, the first one, there's a few places, I mean, I think the Washington Post would be thrilled to publish stuff like this anytime it comes in. Um, I don't, I think there's a few places that, you know, the problem is they can't get people to do it, not that everybody wants to do it and they, they don't want to publish it. It's rare to come across this kind of work. And, uh, but that's a few places in journalism. Most places aren't that interested. And, you know, I, I, I have to say sort of fondly and jokingly, um, there's this, some of the journalists in the room may have heard of the Neiman Narrative Conference. So um, it's in Boston. And one year uh, I spoke at it. And so there was this big snowstorm um, and, and there was no plane service out of Boston. So everybody had to take the train to get home. And I was at the train station. I happened to run into our former publisher, Donald E. Graham of the Washington Post, who had been stranded by the snowstorm. So he sort of came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I was at this narrative journalism conference. And he sort of, somewhat kidding, throws this huge fit and says, God damn it, those are the people who are trying to drive newspapers out of business. And I said, why is that, Don? And he said, because whatever happened to the 12-inch story, you know? Um, they are the people who want to make everybody think that they're a literary figure and they have to write seven-part series and that's why we're losing readership and what about the cop in, you know, Prince William County and you've heard that lecture. But at the same time, I mean, he would kill to publish that series again. So, but there aren't a lot like him. On reparations, I, you know, it, this is something that happens to all of us a lot. You write about an issue as a reporter and then you got, get asked to take a sort of policy position on the issue. So it's easy for me to say, yeah, I'm for reparations. But the truth is, you know, then you got to say, well, how much should they be? Can we afford it, et cetera? I don't have that all worked out in my mind. Um, but notionally, yes. And, and I, I've just, you know, finished or am finishing a book on uh, Reconstruction, which I sus suspect will stir this pot a little more um, because this is the time when people were supposed to get 40 acres and a mule and they didn't get that and then things happened that uh, I, I think most people aren't fully aware of that, you know, the reparations are associated with slavery uh, 
And after the Civil War, for many years, things happened that could also give rise to claims for reparations. So, anybody else? Or are you a questioner or a lever? Que okay. <laughs> Well, it's 9 o'clock, so let's uh, call it a night, and thanks again very much. And <laughs>